It's great to be here on this lovely campus. Um, I'm going to tell you about probing uh, the BFSS dual geometry. That's, that's going to be the last part of my talk, but I want to set up the, uh, the problem, um, give some introduction, and I'm going to, my introduction is going to be based on super membranes. We haven't heard anything about them here in, so far, so I thought I'd uh, set that context a little bit, just very briefly. Uh, I'll describe a little bit of the dual geometry, where it comes from. Um, I'll describe my uh, D4 brain probes, which are, we're going to use to probe that geometry. And I will spend some time on the lattice formulation. It's an opportunity for me to describe the lattice formulation a little bit more than maybe I would uh, normally do. And I think there are some interesting features which may be of interest to, uh, uh, to at least some members of the audience. So I apologize to the others if they're not that interested in the details of the lattice. Uh, so uh, membrane actions uh, are based on the Nambu-Goto, or one can reformulate them as in terms of polygraph formulation with a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, so basically, they're the world volume of um, a, the membrane is taken as the action, where the metric is the induced metric. So this is a generalization of the particle, of the relativistic particle action. One can add to these some higher form uh, gauge forms. And this is the analog of charging them. So when one has charged membranes, and they're charged under these, these forms. Uh, one can generalize them even further by adding an anti-symmetric part to the to G mu which to get direct barn infeld and uh, direct barn infeld action and one could even go further and describe extrinsic curvature terms various other things um but I, i'm not going to go into uh, most of these things but the uh, formulation that's of interest here is the supersymmetric uh, Nambu-Goto model. The supersymmetrization of this only works in space-time dimension 4, 5, 7, and 11. And the constraint is really coming from the spinner sector of the theory. The number of spinner degrees of freedom grows much more rapidly than the number of uh, components of the scalar. So to get supersymmetry, there's clearly an upper dimension, and some of the uh, fields type identities necessary only exist in these dimensions. The BFSS model arises, and this is the model that, we, that I will discuss, I spend a little, uh, reasonable amount of time on. Uh, it arises from gauge fixing this uh, action, uh, then the membrane is taken uh, to be some surface that's quantized. So in the end, one is thinking of the membrane as being deformed into some non-commutative space. Uh, this was originally developed by Hoppe uh, in his PhD thesis uh, under the supervision of Goldstone, his method. And the same model reemerges in different ones, in different sectors. Once one uh, follows this path, one gets the Hamiltonian in the supersymmetric sector setting, which has these nine scalars and these Majur Majurana fermions, 16 component Majurana fermions. And this is a 16 component uh, supersymmetric, or 16 uh, supercharged uh, model that we've heard uh, many talks describe. It arises as the dimensional reduction of 11-dimensional supersymmetric gang mills to one dimension. It's a quantum mechanical model. Uh, so, and it also describes a system of N interacting D0 brains. That's the broad setting. The, there's a deformation of this if I consider the membrane not in a, uh, in a flat background, but I consider it on a supersymmetric plane wave then there's a 
one parameter, mass parameter, that deforms this, and it, this preserves all of the 16 supercharges and gives a, an additional contribution when one follows through the procedure to, to the Hamiltonian. Uh, the resulting Hamiltonian is the uh, plane wave matrix model or the BMN model. The partition function, once, now once we have a Hamiltonian for the system, we can discuss the partition function. We're interested in the trace of e to the minus beta h. I should have said that there's a Gauss law constraint that comes with uh, by uh, the reduction as well. There's one gauge uh, degree of freedom left, one constraint that needs to be satisfied, and this gives a Gauss law constraint. And it, it says that we are looking, that physical states are uh, SUN or UN singlet, singlets. So the energy of the system is then the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And that's one of the principal observers, observables. If I look at this model and I just look at the fermionic sector, uh, the fermions are, uh, they're real variables and they should be, they're real Grassmann variables, so they should be quantized as elements of the Clifford algebra. If I break up this representation, a given representation of this, you see that it breaks up in, uh, well, we're in this, when we have, um, in copies of it, we have many tensor products of this 256, 2 to the 8 is 256, and we've n squared minus 1 copies of this. Or if we break up the, this under S09, which is the little group in 11 dimensions, it splits into 44, 84, and 128, which is suggestive of the graviton, the anti-symmetric tensor, and the 128 of 11 dimensional supergravity. So one can, one can see that it's plausible that there'd be a reasonable connection or a close connection between this uh, model and supergravity, even if one uh, doesn't use the string motivation. The Lagrangian for this, this um, system is uh, one, an integral over time. We have one covariant derivative implementing the constraint, our Gauss law constraint, with the gauge field. This flat potential with the flat directions we've heard much about. And we have the fermionic sector. And Psi, in this formulation, this is a 10 dimensional. Uh, supersymmetric Yang Mills reduced to, to one dimension, and Epsi is a 32 component Majorana vial fermion. And this is the 10 dimensional formulation. And uh, the uh, Clifford algebra has uh, satisfies this. Okay. And again, there's a chain in additional terms of the action for the, uh, the BMN model. If we look then, just to understand what the non-perturbative predictions are likely to be, uh, the, one should go to the supergravity and look for the, a suitable solution with the same symmetries. And uh, um, the solution in flat space that corresponds to this BFSS model, it has this harmonic uh, term. It, it, it's a reduction on this M theory circle, which I'm not going to go into, to get down to the uh, to the ten dimensional case, this is part of the famous BFSS paper. Uh, so one gets this metric, um, and uh, the one form comes from uh, in the the eleven dimensional picture. It's coming from um, a kaluza klein reduction on the S one. To get to, to describe the thermal physics of it, the idea is to introduce a, to include a black hole in the gravitational system. And the Hawking temperature of that black hole should describe the temperature of the system. So we're going to identify the beta in the trace rate of minus beta H with the Hawking temperature of the black hole system. Uh, and this is part of the ADS correspondence, which uh, we should check. And because there's Hawking radiation in the system, once we turn on the quantum corrections, 
one expects that the model should be should uh, have instabilities. The classical limit is valid at large n, so one expects that small n that the Hawking radiation should be a problem, and uh, there's a belief that the instabilities are related to that. Um, it's difficult to check that, but there's we, uh, we heard in some of the earlier talks some uh, some discussion of that. Once we include the metric in here, we get a black hole geometry. Uh, this f is one minus u to the u, zero to the seven over u to the seven, and it uh, describes the black hole horizon. We can extract, relate the temperature then to the geometry by in the usual way, and we get this relation that u zero is related to the temperature. We can go to the black hole entropy and the, uh, obtain the prediction for the energy, this energy, and this is the leading prediction, which um, we've heard about already in, the, in, in that. So one of the goals of simulating the model is to test this prediction. One can derive, subs, uh, in principle, one can derive a l long series of uh, corrections to this. Um, some of them are known. And um, the powers, as um, Anada pointed out, uh, are, are derived already. And we can, uh, we can compare that with the, uh, the model. Some, some of the observables one might be interested in the system are the energy, as I described, which is just the expectation value of uh, the, uh, in the, in the path integral form is given by this expression. One might be interested in the, some, something which, these are the objects which are sensitive to the flat directions and uh, diverge, as we've heard lots of discussion about. One can look at these, and one can look at, in fact, them in more detail without summing over I. One can look at them individually. The Polyakov loop, which shows a uh, phase transition, uh, confining, deconfining phase transition. And so those are some of the, one can continue uh, into a, an extensive list, but these are some of the elementary uh, observables one might want to look at. I want to spend some time discussing the lattice discretization of this, because uh, uh, to put it on the computers, you know, we, we need to discretize it. And the complications come from the fermion sector. So in the fermion sector, we want to promote the derivatives d tau to e to the a d tau minus one, we exponentiate them. Once the, when the gauge field is included in here, this gives the correct prescription. The fermions, uh, well, as you see here, this is an anti-symmetric object. These are Majorana. I've gone to a particular representation of spin nine in which the charge conjugation is the identity and all the gamma matrices are, are symmetric. That's the simplest prescription. Well, one can describe it in any formulation, but this is just to, to illustrate it. It's, um, this is what's the simplest way of describing it. So the fermion, this is an anti-symmetric object. So if I put in this for my derivative, only the anti-symmetric part of it survives. And so it's, it, this is anti-symmetric. However, this formulation has doublers. One might want to try and eliminate the doublers by a simple Wilson prescription. But the simple Wilson term proportional to the identity matrix here is going to drop out. It's, a symmet it's symmetric. So one needs to add something anti-symmetric as the, part of the Wilson prescription. The first order formulation of the lattice Dirac operator, we take the lattice Dirac operator and we just add a Wilson term and we pick something anti-symmetric from the Clifford algebra. Uh, so I'm just going to pick a unit in the Clifford algebra. So sigma, sigma dagger, it's anti-symmetric, it squares to the identity for simplicity. And we can use now the standard Wilson Laplacian to suppress the doublers with this. So what are the choices for, there are now some choices for sigma. We could choose any element of the Clifford algebra. Since the gammas themselves are, uh, are symmetric, uh, the, we can choose anti-symmetric uh, combination. This is the product of two, this is the commutator of two, uh, two gammas. This is anti-symmetric. 
come here, the anti symmetrization of three of them is also anti symmetric. Others are symmetric, except those given by duals of these with an epsilon. So those are, this, this is the only choice, this is the most general choice one can choose for that. The standard choice by uh, the initial people who simulated this, uh, Simon and uh, Toby Wiseman and uh, uh, Manasori, Masadori and his um, colleagues, was to choose this sigma, value of sigma. Something, they may, the basis doesn't matter, I've just chosen that. However, if one looks at this operator, just the free operator here, one can see that the inverse of it is very easy to, to examine. Uh, it has this sigma in it, so um, it's dagger. The only, this is Hermitian, this term is anti-Hermitian, so we got a minus sign when we took the dagger. The square of it gives this, we look at it at low momentum, we see that there's a residual term here proportional to sigma. So it has this lattice artifact. When one calculates, just looks at, uh, includes the, uh, the scalars in here, you see that this lattice artifact has, uh, induces a positive mass term for some of the scalars and a negative mass term for, uh, for some of the others, it, it proportional to A. So this can lead to undesirable effects, and it in particular uh, caused serious problems when we started to study the BMN model. Uh, so we were forced to, uh, to go to a second order formulation. The second order formulation, well, again, uh, one can go to K2, can promote the Dirac operator, to something anti-symmetric, that should be meant to be a minus sign, uh, with and some additional term, and we can put some linear combination of them. One needs uh, only, there's only one free parameter because one wants to recover the linear term when uh, A goes to zero. Uh, if I choose R to be minus one third, the corrections are seriously suppressed so the leading corrections are actually coming from the Wilson term in this, this because this is k, k, uh, this is k squared. If I choose R1 to be zero, and this, uh, my uh, del squared term, we get it k to the fourth as the leading correction. So this is the, what the artifact looks like in the first art of form, the second art of form. Second uh, thing that we do is we choose the, parameters, we choose R1 to be, R to be minus 1 over 3, and we choose R2 so that we match the maximum number of bar frequencies. We want to, we're interested in the low energy set part of this, so we choose our parameters so that we get maximum coverage of maths bar frequencies. And we can typically get around lambda to the, or the cutoff to uh, the uh, a quarter of them to be almost perfectly fit, and it's, it's pretty good linear are pretty good um, approximation to, uh, to it over the entire range. And this, these are, I've shown the graph here is for uh, when the mass is included, uh, the mass term has a, an additional uh, gamma one, two, three, and it causes the difference between these two in, uh, in uh, the alternative code when I choose. Uh, no, so. So, sorry, we, sorry, the other thing is we chose our sigma to be the three gamma one because this can anti-commute with uh, the three ones in the mass deformation. So that was a preferable choice, and these are the parameters that were optimal for us. Just to check that everything is in order, we repeated the computations of uh, the Polykov loop and uh, et cetera. For, I'm showing it here for n is equal to 16, L is equal to 24. The red dots are our simulations, and the, this is an extrapolation of Berkowitz uh, et al's uh, high precision simulations. And I've taken their data for n equals 16 and put it on their dots here, and our one are the red ones. And with the last size was 24. We look at the energy, we see, okay, it looks, it's, it's again, 
very competitive. It's a little bit lower, which I think is because we have slightly low, smaller, smaller lattice effects. This is not an extrapolation to the, uh, to the continuum. This is just for a fixed N and a fixed L. And so you see the, the trend is here. And I've included the best estimate of what the supergravity computation is. I'm uh, uh, R squared. Well, it's also comparable. Right? So the red again are our, are our data, and the blue are taken from this paper. We look at it in a little bit more detail because, they are, as I mentioned, the uh, Wilson term, the way we've introduced the Wilson term, splits the x's into uh, those in the same direction as the um, as the gammas and in the uh, the other one. So we've split it into an SO6 and an SO3 sector, SO3 with the Wilson term. And the difference of how these two behave, they should agree, they should be one, uh, or, or this should be zero, sorry. I've taken this difference they should, and normalized. They should, I've missed a, missed a six here. Uh, it should be zero. So you see that our errors are growing as the temperature is reduced. But this is at fixed lattice spacing, so this is as expected. But it gives you an indication of how, how precision it is. And um, the... Uh, um, so now let me proceed to probing the dual geometry. I'm going a little slower than I expected. So uh, the, we, this is a generalization of the uh, P, or a specialization of the DP, D4 plus P setup. So we're going to add D4 brains in the gravitational picture. These would correspond to adding, uh, the setup is, is described in, by, it was initially described by uh, Berkowitz and Douglas and runs down these papers. So what one needs to do is one needs to add some additional degrees of freedom to the Hamiltonian. Uh, these are now fundamental fermions and bosons, so we've added a fundamental sector to it. Uh, the scale, we have additional scalars, we're not gauging it, this sector, it's, it's got a global SU in NF. Or, Symmetry and the fermionic sector, which we can again treat in in a similar way to uh, uh, what I described with the uh, uh, the uh, BFSS, and this is a dimensional reduction. You're, most of you are familiar with it in, in one guise or another. It's a dimensional reduction of n equals one and d equals six, Susie. And again, the lattice discretization it works. The dual picture of what we're doing here is we're adding a D4 brain. So now, once we keep the number of D4 brains small, it won't affect the geometry. They will act as a probe. If, we, if they act as a probe, then they should be described by a dirac barn enfeld action. F is zero in this setting. So we've just got the induced metric. The metric that it's living on should be that geometry I described in the VFSS setting. We want, to, we want to embed our D4 brain into that geometry. So we have different options. We could embed it way off at infinity, away from the black hole, or we can bring it in, or it can, it's an infinite D4 brain. We can, it can drop into the black hole and continue out to infinity. Uh, the gravity predictions we can extract by examining the embedding and exp uh, expanding uh, near infinity, near U goes to infinity. Um, I'll come back to, uh, to that, but sorry, there was one other comment. One expects that there's an additional phase transition in the system as one goes through this. One can derive a, an analytic expression for what this embedding is, but I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip this because I'm, I'm out of time. Um, if one parameterizes the DBI action by the embedding, one gets an effective action for, uh, for, for theta, the embedding coordinate, and expanding around uh, U goes to infinity, one can extract uh, the effective mass 
the renormalized mass and the condensate. Uh, so these ones are proportional to the bare mass and the condensate. We, uh, um, we can analyze it in the derivative of, with respect, of C with respect to M analytically from the solution. The, we can find the solution to this uh, numerically, but we can find the derivative analytically it takes this form. It's nice t to the five over, four over five scaling in it as well. Now putting it on, putting that system on the lattice, precisely in the way that I described, one can compare. This is the theoretical curve for, for that, and the other quantity we're looking at is the slope of this as a function of temperature. The, uh, as you see, the cur this, this curve is actually independent of temperature. Once you scale out the temperature, as by that four fifth uh, as behavior, one should uh, get a universal curve. So when, as one varies the temperature, it should fall on this. This is for t equals 0 0.8. As we go down in temperature, the lattice corrections become larger, so one needs to go to finer systems. We're looking at that at the moment, but this is, um, this is for, if I believe, if I remember correctly, I should have written it, it's N equals 10, and uh, NF is equal to 1. So there's surprisingly good agreement between that and the, and the, uh, and the dual gravity. The other quantity we can get is the slope. The quantity I showed you in the last transparency was this, the slope at the origin here. So we can, extra we can use our data for the slope at different values to extrapolate this. And as you see, scaling for different lattice sizes now for that quantity, we have lambda equals up to lambda equals 48. We get a solid prediction. And it agrees, uh, uh, as you can see, rather well with the, uh, uh, the prediction from the gravity. So this is, this is um, uh, a rather strong confirmation that something uh, is valid in, the, uh, in that description of it. This is a, a highly non-trivial probe of that geometry because we're, we're putting something that's probing the geometry as a function of the radius, as we the mass varying the mass is parameter is uh, varying the embedding. I should have said that. Um, and I'm just out of time, so let me pose it to questions. All right? Okay. So we have two or three minutes for questions. Do you have any question or comment? Then uh, I did you wonder in this case though the temperature region you studied is uh, uh, not very low. For, for example, we looked at that's what uh, I presented. We've looked at we looked at lower temperatures. Yeah, lattice low, corrections are significant. Yeah, and also we we went down you know like t all the way down to zero point four and looked at the energy of the black hole, but still the alpha prime correction was not negligible. It was like 30% order. And I wonder, is there any reason that in this case, somehow supergravity agreement with the supergravity was very good? The and agreement I, is, is surprisingly good. We believe that, uh, you see, what's happening here is in this region, um, it's what's happening here in this region is this is where the uh, D4 is embedded into the black hole. The black hole is relatively small, so you're actually not probing a huge variation in the geometry. The geometry, the geometry of the uh, DE forebrain is not varying significantly, and we think that there are that alpha prime corrections are cancelling due to uh, uh, due to the, some effect in that region. In our case, when T was 0 0.5, uh, you know, the deviation from uh, supergravity was 50% or even more. So it, it's really... The deviation it, is larger. I, we, I could show you the, uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, t is equal to 0 0.5. I didn't put it on here, uh -huh. but it, it is significantly above this. Uh -huh. Awesome. Uh -huh. So it, but whether that's lattice effects or 1 oh, over okay. n effects. But, uh, but if, if there is physically, you know, the reason why, if there is any physical reason that the uh, deviation alpha prime correction at the, the actor is small, maybe it's much better quantity to look at. So I, I think it's, a, I think it, the alpha prime corrections are, uh, we suspect that they are actually small. And also I had the impression. The, the other reason that it's a good quantity to look at is that you have a universal curve. So the variation, even if I change it, alpha prime corrections, they are going to just give some small deviation to this universal curve. So one is not looking at, when the, the leading temperature dependence has been pulled out of this. So the uh, subleading temperature dependence is suppressed as well in looking at in this variable. Thanks. Is there any other question or comment? So, so there was this uh, part which you just skip. Maybe you can summarize what was the statement about the ADHM data in this? Oh yes, it's a. It's a this is a. It's a standard comment about uh, n equals uh, two Yang uh, super Yang mills that uh, they can be uh, the uh, the bosonic sector has the ground state of it is given by the ADHM data. So if you know something about the ADHM data, it can uh, uh, suggest that you may in have additional complications because of these zero modes right, in the model. But the bosonic one is fine. And uh, when we simulated the bosonic one, the other comment was one can measure and uh, we have analytic control over the, uh, uh, the bosonic one, even with this uh, uh, with this, um, these fundamental degrees of freedom. Right. So you spotted my ADHM. <laughs> okay, then let's move to Asano. Oh, one more question. Sorry. Uh, uh, just a question about the lattice artifacts. I mean, you added this, uh, we, we would call it the twisted uh, Wilson term to your. Uh, Naive, uh, uh, naive uh, thermal term. So we did similar things in 10 years ago in, in field theory, added exactly the same term. Uh, well, at that time it wasn't gamma, what was, did you take uh, eight, nine? We took another gamma, but anyway. We, we, we actually take a different gammas in our simulation yeah. as well because. But the point, the point was uh, there's a free parameter in front of it, the so-called the R parameter, yes. which shows up in a twisted uh, mass construction. Now, we could fine tune this parameter such that at least for the is switch off the interaction, you get an A to the power of four uh, correct uh, uh, operator. Did you, did you try that? Oh, the, let me go back to see. You no, know, you showed it in the middle of a talk. Uh, ah. We, we you know, now no, next, yeah. Mm -hmm. We got one, into one, the, maybe, the, maybe one more back. Uh -huh. this, this is the first R the formulation. The R parameter here, yes, there's it, nothing you can do uh, the R1, if you're you can, going to tube this and yes. make it a very small, you're going to have a problem with your Wilson fermions not being suppressed. Yeah, no, no, it, it was, you do lattice perturbation here, so to say. And yes, I, we've the gone R1. to a, the second order formulation, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you can the second order formulation, we yeah. choose R1 to be zero. Why? Uh, because any time we have an R1 not zero, it's going, the R, lattice artifact is going to go up here to some non-zero value. Okay. We can just check that uh, as we send the momentum to, okay. to uh, zero, the inverse of this is going to have something that's going to uh, have a Laplacian. Mm -hmm. will, uh, and at zero momentum, this term is negligible. Yes. There's a le leading Laplacian on the bottom that cancels this. So you're always going to have something proportional to R1 unless you insist on a, a, a second order formulation. So yes. this lattice artifact, you're distorting it, but it will mm -hmm. never come down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To go to, if I set it to zero and use purely a higher order form, mm -hmm. no problem. It starts at zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a motivation for using higher order form. But it causes significant problems in the BMN case more than the, the uh, that, but also one should use the three gamma, uh, I believe in the BMN case. Yeah. 
very briefly. <laughs> so, um, just um, you mentioned briefly the flat direction, and you didn't choose any additional regulator for them, or? Uh, no, we didn't actually. Yeah, that, that, that was another comment that I, I didn't make. Uh, one can choose a more general. Uh, I described the options here for for this. The, the flat directions for large enough N are not a problem. The three gamma prescription uh, shows up the problem, the same problem of the flat directions at lower temperature, not hugely lower, but slightly, significantly lower. However, I can use a combination of three. Uh, I can use gamma one, two, three plus gamma four, five, six plus gamma uh, seven, eight, nine, three sets of anti-commuting objects. That one has larger lattice effects, but it completely suppresses the flat directions. There is no problem for small n down to very low temperatures. At least as low the lowest temperatures we went to. Okay, then we are running out of time. So